Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Marcia Inhorn, the William K. Landman, Jr. Professor of Anthropology and International Affairs at Yale University. Professor Inhorn's research interests revolve around science and technology studies, gender and feminist theory, including masculinity studies, religion and bioethics, globalization and global health, cultures of biomedicine and ethnomedicine, stigma, and human suffering. Over the past 20 years, she has conducted multi-sided research on the social impact of infertility and assisted reproductive technologies in Egypt, Lebanon, the United Arab Emirates, and Arab America. Her many books include Local Babies, Global Science, Gender, Religion, and In Vitro Fertilization in Egypt, and Infertility and Patriarchy, The Cultural Politics of Gender and Family Life in Egypt. Today we talk with Professor Inhorn about her new book, The New Arab Man, Emergent Masculinities, Technologies, and Islam in the Middle East. Welcome, Professor Inhorn. Well, thank you, Marilyn. I'm really pleased to be here. Let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Okay, well this book I have to say is a real labor of love. Um, it was basically 10 years in the making mm -hmm. and you know, based on your introduction, all of my work, I'm a medical anthropologist and a gender scholar and I've worked for 20 years in the Middle East and almost all of my work up until this point had been on women suffering from infertility and the kinds of difficult treatment decisions they had to make, their quest for conception, the introduction of in vitro fertilization into the region in the very late 1980s, and you know, sort of the changing trajectory of how people who were childless could overcome their infertility. Mm -hmm. And during this long journey of about 20 years of looking at infertility as a global reproductive health issue, I realized that the sort of missing component um, are men, it is men, <laughs> and men themselves um, contribute to more than half of the world's infertility problems. Mm -hmm. Male infertility is really what we would call a neglected global reproductive health issue. Um, and it can actually be, be very serious, intractable, uncurable, chronic, it's often genetic in origin. And so after having written three books on Egypt, focusing mostly on women, um, the last one focusing a little bit on the men as well, I decided that I needed to do a study in the Middle East of this large problem of male infertility. And that ended up taking me to Lebanon um, for complicated reasons, but I went in the year 2003 and did a very long um, and very intensive study of um, Middle Eastern men from Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, and from a number of other places mm -hmm. um, to talk to them about not only their infertility, but their um, uh, support and commitment to their infertile wives. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, yeah, so that was, it is about infertility and men's engagement with n assisted reproductive technologies to overcome it. But I would say the largest theme of this book, well beyond the infertility and the assisted reproductive technologies in play in the Middle East, is really about Middle Eastern men's changing lives. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the most important thing is that really um, we have n now hundreds of books by scholars and, and other people um, describing various aspects of women's lives in the Middle East, Muslim women, um, you know, women's political involvement, women's changing, you know, norms and practices and education and so on. But men as men, Middle Eastern men as men, really have not been studied in terms of masculinity, their sense of self, their hopes for the future. Mm -hmm. And so through this lens of men who were going through a difficult issue with their wives, I learned so much about masculinity and just about shifting generational norms mm -hmm. in the region. And so I ended up writing a book that's as much about Arab masculinity as it is about treatment for infertility. And I think that is really the big message of the book is that there are emergent masculinities, new kinds of manhood, shifting notions about being a man in the region today. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is the big message of this book. Okay, one of the things that really surprised me that I think many people are not aware of is the high rate of infertility. What is the number? 
Okay. basically. Globally, if you look at any given population in the world, the sort of average is anywhere between 10 and 15 percent. Mm -hmm. Some of the regions of the world have much higher infertility rates, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, for all sorts of reasons. Um, the Middle Eastern region is sort of on the, the global average. I mean, a country like Egypt, with about 80 million people, has about a 15 percent rate of infertility among married couples. Now, within infertility, Generally speaking, it's said that about uh, 30 to 40 percent of cases are female infertility problems, 30 to 40 percent of cases are male infertility problems, mm -hmm. and then the rest, 20 percent or so, are combined male and female infertility problems. So if you take the male issues altogether, it's said that about half of all cases of childlessness involve a male infertility problem. In the Middle East, if you go to IVF clinics across the region, the rates of male infertility are much higher than that. Mm -hmm. um, in clinics that I've worked in, it's between 60, 70 percent of all cases. I have heard from others that there's some regions um, in the Middle East where up to 90 percent of couples coming into clinics, there will be a male infertility problem. So male infertility is a serious problem mm -hmm. in the Middle Eastern region. And wh why is that, do you think? Is there any uh, reason? Yeah, actually, so now what's understood about male infertility is that a lot of it um, is genetic. Um, okay. It's actually little mutations often on the Y chromosome. They mm -hmm. can be spontaneous or they may be related to just um, genetic defects and um, they can run in families and so it's now realized with you know increasing sort of genetic uh, sophistication that a lot of male infertility has a genetic origin. Mm -hmm. In the Middle Eastern region and in other regions of the world, many regions of the world there are high rates of what's called consanguineous marriage where people marry within their family so okay. that cousins may marry each other, first cousins, second cousins and that probably increases the rates mm -hmm. of male factor infertility because um, genetic defects you know, that occur in close unions then get passed on to offspring. Mm -hmm. So what you will find in a country like Lebanon is whole families with you know, several brothers who are infertile, several first cousins, uncles and so forth, that there's actually clustering of male infertility in families. Um, and it's very devastating for those families sure. where, you know, several men are having trouble conceiving. I met many of those cases in the course of my research. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how you did your research. What was your methodology? Yeah, so for about, um, since um, in vitro fertilization, IVF, which is mm -hmm. the sort of base form of assisted reproduction, has come to the region in the late 1980s. It came to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan in 1986. I've been very fortunate to be able to work in um, IVF clinics in a variety of countries and often because very nice IVF physicians have decided that they were willing to let me come and do a project in their clinical population. So I've worked in a number of IVF clinics uh, in, in the Middle East as well as in the Arab American population in Michigan and I have um, you know sort of participated in the lives of these clinics and I have done very in-depth what we would call anthropological or ethnographic interviews with um, hundreds of people. I have now, you know, at last count, I have interviewed more than 300 men, um, both fertile and infertile men, from about 14 different Middle Eastern countries. Um, the majority have been Egyptian, Lebanese, Syrian, and Palestinian. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of solo interviews with just men. I've done a lot of solo interviews with women. And I've done hundreds of couple interviews mm -hmm. together. Um, so, you know, and often, you know, people, these are long interviews where people open up and tell uh, well, me many intimate aspects of their lives. I was actually <laughs> going to say that must have been I would Im imagine and assume that it, that would be very difficult for a man to sit down and talk with a, a, a Western woman, so mm -hmm. to speak, about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. How how did you get past that? Um, I would imagine hesitation or yeah. So that that's an interesting story actually because I had always worked with women throughout the 1980s and early 1990s until. I went back to do my first study in in vitro fertilization clinics in Cairo, Egypt. <clears throat> and there, intending only to work with women, I was sort of ushered into these 
you know, hospital rooms where women were, were recovering from various IVF <coughs> procedures, and their husbands were there. And so the husbands often didn't want to leave. And I ended up in about 40% of my interviews in Egypt, um, including husbands in the interviews. And that's where first I discovered that there were high rates of male infertility. Many of these women were going through procedures because their, their husbands were infertile. And men were talkative. They wanted to talk, you know. And so these were interviews with couples together. Mm -hmm. But I realized that the you know, the lack of hesitation on the part of Egyptian men to talk to me about their infertility problems was probably a good sign that maybe I could do this with men alone. And I think we've often held a lot of untested assumptions that mm -hmm. somehow women can only talk to women about uh, sensitive or intimate things, that men can only talk to men. And I was abiding by that thinking until I, not only you know the studies I did in Egypt, but I talked to some Middle Eastern male colleagues and I said, I really want to do this study of male infertility in the region. I see it's a really big issue. And I think I should get a male graduate student to go do the work. And I actually tried to get a male graduate student to go do the work. And a couple of my very supportive Middle Eastern born colleagues said, no, 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 no. You, Marsha, you should go do this project because at my stage of life, you know, being middle aged, sort of maternal figure, um, men are going to, in the Middle East, will have a much more difficult time telling other men that they have reproductive or sexual problems. Mm -hmm. You, as a Western woman, quasi doctor like, maternal, you're probably in a much better position to mm -hmm. get people to talk to you. And so that I decided sense. that that might make sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I wrote that into my grant proposals, you know, and I guess everyone believed me and I was able to go do the project. I will say, however, in all of my years of working on this topic, you know, it's more than 20 years now, I have never had a single woman not agree to, to talk to me. I mean, mm -hmm. women often really want to unburden themselves. I've never had anybody uh, disagree or you know reject being in, in mm -hmm. one of my studies but with men for the first time in my life I had refusals you know outright refusals no I don't have time no I just don't want to talk about this I'm not in a good mood mm -hmm. and I, I can say in general it was it was difficult for a lot of men I I felt like a lot of men were in a very bad mood about their situation mm -hmm. situations you know reproductively stressful lives for a lot of men in the Middle East um, that have been made more stressful in the last couple of years and so a lot of it was men unburdening the things they had been through. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a lot of Lebanese and Palestinian and now Syrian men have been through war, often as, you know, civilians. Uh, they have had to flee. Their lives are very hard, economically difficult. And so a lot of the book is really about, um, you know, just the stresses of life, mm -hmm. living in a region where everything is pretty unstable. Right, right. In your prologue, you um, talk about a man named Hamza, and I think he really does um, paint a very interesting picture. So why don't you tell us about him? Yeah, he was, I called him Hamza. He was um, a driver that I ended up, you know, not only having him drive me and my little family, I had my husband and two young children with me in Lebanon, but he ended up being really, he became a friend over time. And his story was pretty typical of uh, the story of a lot of Lebanese young men. He, um, he was a Shia Muslim. He grew up in a sort of poor part of southern Lebanon. Um, his family, his father was involved in one of the Shia political parties. And then when the war broke out, there were like 10 children in the family. The war broke out. His father was taken from the car and, and killed, mm. leaving uh, a widowed w woman with all of these children to support. And so worried that the boys of the family were going to be conscripted into militias, um, Hamza, like many young Lebanese men, fled. He, he went actually to the Arab Gulf and he began working there, helped to support his family back in Lebanon. And he, like many young Middle Eastern men, he chose to marry his cousin, um, which is just a very preferred form of marriage in many parts of the world. And so she moved to the Gulf with him um, where they discovered that you know, there was no pregnancy forthcoming. And basically, he, it, w it was discovered over time that he had a pretty serious male factor infertility problem. But um, like many childless couples, Arab couples, they really loved each other. You know, it was a very committed relationship, very um, loving, precious relationship. You know, as he put it, we have an understanding with each other. She didn't want to leave him. She loved him. He didn't want to leave her. 
um, even though um, often when people are the infertile one, they'll often tell their partner, look at, you're free to divorce, I don't want to saddle you with my problem. Mm -hmm. And most often people say, no, no, you're more precious to me than having children, I'm going to stick with you. And so they worked for a long time to save up money um, and eventually to build a home for themselves when things settled down in Lebanon. And I just happened to meet him, you know, he was a taxi driver and you soon discover in the Middle East when you ask a series of polite questions that when people have been married for a while and there are no children, you know automatically that there's some sort of an infertility problem because mm -hmm. within marriage it's almost mandatory to start having children. And so he'd been married for a long time, there were no kids, and so I told him what I was doing there and I ended up, you know, figuring out very quickly what the problem was and I ended up helping him. I explained to him, you really, really need to use an assisted reproductive technology to overcome this problem. You'll not get pregnant otherwise. And so I got involved in his journey to assisted tech reproductive technologies, um, which are expensive, they're physically taxing, it wasn't easy. Um, and during the process of all of this sort of driving back and forth and helping him get to clinics and meeting his wife and his family, at one point um, I, I realized that among the Shia Muslims of Lebanon that people um, could go one of two ways. They, and one of the ways that you could go was to be a sympathizer or a member of Hezbollah, the Shia Muslim political organization mm -hmm. which officially um, is regarded by the U.S. government as a, as a terrorist organization. Right. And so in one long drive back from southern Lebanon, I finally came to that moment of saying, gosh, Hamza, you know, do you follow this person or that person? And then I figured out, well, he was sympathetic with Hezbollah. And uh, we had a very interesting conversation. He said, no, I'm not a terrorist. I don't want you to think I'm a bad person. I said, you know, no, 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 I understand, you know, a lot about what Hezbollah does for poor people in the south of Lebanon. And, um, you know, Because so they do offer a lot of social they services. They offer, offer a lot of social right. services, especially in the kind of absence of an official government. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was this moment of sort of like, well, this is just, he's a good man, he's my friend, he loves my children, and I, his political convictions are what they are, right. but we have come to an understanding with each other. And I realized, you know, in a way, this was part of sort of humanizing Middle Eastern men, Arab men, who in the Western media, you know, and in, in scholarship as well, they're always sort of cast in one way, especially in Western media. We mm -hmm. only hear bad stories about terrorists, religious zealots, you know, armed protesters, violent men who make women veil or keep them in pro mm -hmm. you know. We hear many things about Middle Eastern men, Arab men, and many of those things are just caricatures about who men are. Mm -hmm. And so the book, if anything, is just, I, I think it's a humanizing account of, mm -hmm. you know, somebody like Hamza, who, yes, he sympathizes with Hezbollah for various reasons, but he's a real flesh and blood kind person mm -hmm. who arrived at that point in his life for, you know, certain reasons. And the book, um, I think, has many, many accounts mm -hmm. of men's lives um, that you end up thinking, well, they're just, you know, normal human beings like, like everyone else. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And the Hamza story does have a happy ending. Yes, it does. Um, actually, after repeated trials of this reproductive technology, there's a one reproductive technology called ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. It's a variant of IVF, especially designed to overcome male infertility. He, he and his wife tried it three times. Um, they had to move clinics. And finally, the third trial was the charm. And, uh, you know, I got a very early morning call. I was in, back in the States from a very excited Hamza saying, you know, Doctora, guess what happened? You know, she's pregnant. And indeed, on one of my trips back to Lebanon in about 2009, um, I, um, you know, went to meet him and there was a beautiful little girl mm -hmm. um, there. So they had had, you know, a successful ICSI right. pregnancy. Um, and a birth of a child. So uh, it was a great ending to that story. Mm -hmm. I, I have to say the sort of sad part about these technologies, I mean, I, I'm sort of, um, although I, I, I see the joy when they work, and there is a lot of joy when they do work, these are not ultimately highly successful technologies. Mm -hmm. They're very expensive and globally 
assisted reproduction in the best centers under the best conditions only works up to 40% of the times. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually a very you know, positive wow. um, sort of figure for people who have more serious infertility problems. Mm -hmm. The older you get, the percentage of success, success goes down. And so they're ultimately, um, they're the only solution for a lot of cases of infertility like his. Um, and he was very lucky to have that child because mm -hmm. he had a pretty serious male infertility right. problem. But um, the sort of, what, what shall we say, the sort of downside or the dark side of assisted reproduction is that it often doesn't work. And mm -hmm. in fact, a lot of the men in my study had gone through rep repeated trials of ICSI and IVF and they had nothing to show for it. Mm -hmm. Well, your book does show a very different um, portrayal of um, the Arab man versus the stereotypes that we typically tend to gravitate towards. So thank you very much for being here today and sharing some of your work. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. For more information about Professor Inhorn and her research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.